Good evening. Or would it be more appropriate to say good night? <laughs> Who knows? Uh, in any case, it's late uh, in the evening. I welcome you to the session uh, entitled What is a way forward uh, for Bosnia? Uh, we have a wonderful panel. I will introduce my panel in a second. And we have obviously the wonderful audience. We have some kind of competition uh, between Bosnia and Middle East. Uh, it seems that uh, Middle East uh, is uh, winning right now, uh, at least in terms of people attending the session. But I can promise you this one will be more fascinating than the Middle East one. Uh, so stay, stay, stay with us, uh, or if there is someone who wants to join us. Uh, now, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm particularly thankful to the organizers to put a session on Bosnia again uh, on the schedule of the Belgrade Security Forum. Uh, but at the same time, each time when Bosnia is uh, put on a schedule of a large conference, uh, it is usually uh, because of some kind of crisis uh, or some kind of cluelessness of what to do in Bosnia uh, is again on the agenda. Uh, we just recently experienced the uh, uh, elections uh, and now we are experiencing the post-electoral period. We don't know if the uh, uh, elections, and we will discuss it in the first round, if the elections uh, delivered more of the same or something new. At least uh, we have uh, uh, future members of the, of the presidency of Bosnia and Herzegovina that promise to join not us by Skype or via Skype tonight, but uh, sometimes the sessions of the presidency. Who knows? Uh, it's going to be a very, very interesting time. But let us focus today. Uh, uh, on something that is really challenging when we discuss Bosnia. Usually, uh, uh, when you speak about Bosnia, you have uh, a moment where you find yourself uh, in a similar situation like in the movie Groundhog Day. Uh, you start uh, uh, discussing the ethnopolitics, you start discussing the outcomes of the elections, you see the same faces, same people. Uh, and if you would ask the, the, the uh, officials in, in Brussels, uh, they will probably uh, tell you that they have the same perception uh, and the Bosnians will tell you that they are part of this Grand Hog Day uh, 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 moment at the same time. Uh, so there is this kind of a moment when we discuss Bosnia and there is a second kind of a moment that we usually oscillate and navigate between pessimism or uh, optimism. So pessimism telling that Bosnia, that's, that's, that's uh, uh, basically not solvable, uh, Everything is dark, political crisis, and some kind of optimism where we see different energies pushing forward, where we try to imagine a better Bosnia. Uh, today, we will uh, try not to be in that movie, Groundhog Day, uh, uh, regarding the content. And today, we will uh, uh, try not to uh, be stuck in that kind of optimism, pessimism. Uh, paradigm that we usually have, but to make a kind of a way forward, at least in thinking. Uh, uh, and uh, let me, uh, by, by putting this kind of a first, first uh, outlining the horizon for the debate, let me introduce uh, the most wonderful panel that you can imagine. Uh, and this is a panel uh, that consists of, uh, of Bosnian and Herzegovinians. Uh, few of them, uh, well, Four of us, which still, as I am from Bosnia originally, uh, still a Bosnian citizen. Uh, Alida Vracic is probably a Bosnian citizen still. Uh, Denis Graz, obviously, and Adi Cherimagic, of course. Uh, Morika, Ma Marika, Marika, sorry, Marika, Marika Jolai uh, uh, is a kind of a co opted Bosnian in Herzegovina. So uh, she spent so much time in, uh, in Bosnia and did her PhD. Uh, on a, on a Bosnia-related topic, so basically that we regard her uh, as being a Bosnian. So we tend to co-opt people, and we have co-opted so many of you, Toby Fogel and Kurt, and so, so the real Bosnians are among us. Uh, uh, so, but let me just go one by one. Alida Vracic, uh, uh, a co-founder of, of uh, Populari, uh, a think tank in Sarajevo, uh, now uh, uh, working also for European Council for Foreign Relations. Just recently, uh, Alida published uh, a widely uh, uh, quoted uh, uh, and discussed uh, paper on emigration, uh, on, on, on migration circulation uh, for the European Council for uh, 
for foreign relations. Uh, then next to uh, Alida sits uh, Denis uh, Gratz, uh, co-founder of Nasha Stranka. Uh, and just in a second, we will probably uh, discuss and touch upon Nasha Stranka and the results in the elections. He was chairman of Nasha Stranka between 2011 and 2015, and is still member of the parliament uh, in the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina. And we just uh, were joking a second ago that he, uh, given the tempo that Bosnia usually has uh, in constituting the institutions, uh, we just joked that he is probably going to stay in the parliament at least for the next <laughs> several months. Uh, uh, next to uh, uh, Denis Graz, Adnan Cherimagic uh, he is. Uh, working or has been working since 2015 for European Stability Initiative, uh, now in Berlin, uh, but uh, traveling a lot and spending a lot of time on Bosnia, working on Bosnia. Uh, and Adi Cerimagic, for those of you uh, that were following the debate on Kosovo, Serbia, and this infamous Alpah uh, exchange between Taci and, and uh, Vucic, uh, Adi Cerimagic was one of the people sitting on the panel uh, that managed somehow, which is a kind of a huge success, to irritate in a, be it a positive or negative way, the President Vucic. Uh, so, Adi, uh, congratulations for the, for the irritation. Uh, and then Marika Jolai, uh, independent scholar, policy analyst working, uh, and uh, Alida is also part of that group, uh, Balkans in Europe Policy Advisory uh, uh, Group. Uh, and as I told you, co-opted Bosnian uh, and Herzegovinian, uh, but working intensively on topics of bilateral disputes, uh, education, etc., etc. So, in the first round, uh, we just want to kick it off uh, by looking quickly back to the results of the elections. Uh, so, my question would be: Is it more of the same? Uh, is there anything new? Uh, and is there any kind of, 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 of sparkling? Uh, a moment of hope, uh, uh, and I'm not uh, uh, alluding here at, at, at the new member of the presidency and some other uh, events, but how do you like, quickly uh, judge, uh, judge the results, and, and what do you see, uh, despite the, the overall situation, as a positive, uh, positive moment? And I would like to start in the middle. It's always good to start in the middle, as whole political parties are moving to the middle, uh, but Denis Graz is uh, ideologically not in the middle, so Denis, uh, uh, first assessment of, of the results of Boston elections. Thank you. Oh, okay, thank you, Vedran. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm very glad and very honored to be um, addressing you tonight uh, and bring you maybe the, the freshest information on the recent elections result. Well, you know, uh, it's always, with Bosnia you can always tie it to business as usual and uh, these last results uh, at the first sight are not as promising as we would thought they would be. Uh, the nationalists are the relatively, won the relative uh, uh, victory in the last elections uh, on all levels of power, but um, I must say that this is maybe for the first time in the last 15 years, or at least since uh, 2002, that we have a, a very, a very uh, strong crystallization in the power uh, share mechanisms. Um, according to the elections results, we have a situation where um, in some areas in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and I'm very proud to say that uh, it's uh, in particular very uh, um, visible in Sarajevo and in Sarajevo Canton, we have uh, um, strong support to those political parties and uh, those political ideas that suggest uh, another vision of Bosnia and Herzegovina, which is not a tripartite country, the three people with three pa parties ruling over their constituencies, but um, uh, a, a political, sort of a political um, force building up uh, that envisages uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina based on a abstract citizenry. And what I mean by that is that uh, con very concretely in Sarajevo, Nasha Stanka, uh, that I'm a member of, uh, has become the second strongest force and um, that we are probably going to be able to form government uh, in the Sarajevo area, in Sarajevo Canton, without the nationalists. And you see this sort of development 
on upper levels of power. And, um, and it is also very interesting that we are going to have in the future presidency and in Bosnia-Herzegovina uh, national elections, it's all about who is going to sit um, as the members of the uh, um, three-headed presidency. We are going to have a two opposed, well, narratives on what Bosnia-Herzegovina could look like and would become. And this is on the one hand uh, Milora Dodik uh, in particular, uh, as, as a president of uh, the entity of Republika Srpska, he has now won the seat and will be uh, one of the heads or will represent Bosnia-Herzegovina as the executive head of the state. And he has his own agenda on, uh, well, what Bosnia-Herzegovina should look like or shouldn't look like in the future. And then we have, on the other hand, um, uh, Željko Komčić, who has again won um, the seat for the Croat member of the presidency, which sparks and all these tensions that we have been fighting uh, in the past, well, 15 to 20 years. But I think that um, we have to uh, eventually um, confront these two concepts and see which of these two concepts are basically uh, viable for the future of the country. Will this be a country that uh, is based on the constituent peoples, uh, that is based on the uh, majority vote, on the majority uh, sort of rule, uh, where minorities uh, will remain minorities in terms of being able to elect or being able to be elected? Or are we going to become a country where uh, uh, the holder of sovereignty will be the abstract citizen and as such will be protected um, by the Constitution and by our laws. And um, I'm actually quite uh, excited to see uh, Dodik and Komšić and, well, uh, the Bosniak member of presidency is Mr. Jafirovic now, and I'm pretty much uh, sure that he's going to follow the same politics or the same policy as his predecessor. Uh, but it's going to be very interesting uh, to see how this presidency and how the power is going to be sort of, how is it going to work, how is it going to represent the country, and what is, going to, what is this going to mean for the people in both entities and essentially for, uh, well, the country in general. Thank you so much. Let's just move to Alida. Alida, your take on the results of the elections. Um, thank you for having me. I think I was more excited about Bosnia last night and then I arrived and then I turned on TV here and then I've seen Dodik actually speaking for Serbian TV. There was an interview where he basically described his relation to Bosnia and Herzegovina, being a president of Bosnia and Herzegovina, and basically said that he's going to stop using Bosnian passport to travel and he's going to take Serbian passport to travel. He's going to continue and pursue this policy of, of, of um, strengthening Republika Srpska and then the, the rest of it was very ambivalent and often very contradictory messages that he sent. I'm not sure about presidency, how this is, this is going to play. Um, let's see and let's give it a little bit of time. What I'm more interested in is actually what's happening on lower levels because everything for the citizens of Bosnia, everything happens down there. We're talking about entities, we're talking about cantons, and this is where the services are, this is where the real life happens. So this, this, this makes me a little bit more uh, optimistic, a little bit more excited because as just uh, Dennis explained that well, what we have now in Sarajevo canton, for example, which is a small, teeny tiny, sort of uh, uh, entity within itself is that you have uh, Naša Stranka or our party getting enough votes to actually promote these policies and these matters that are relevant for the citizens of, of this canton and if that could be replicated and further on I would see that as a real change. I would actually really see that as a change and I'm, I'm being cautious here because any change in Bosnia will happen anyway incrementally. I mean what we have seen in the past two decades is that Bosnia has been a lab, te te test lab for, for any type of idea for democracy or how democracy should look like and how the fixes should come about. 
what I'm, I'm, I'm more convinced it will happen is that we're going to have bit by bit, and it's going to start with one party, it's going to start with one canter, and it's going to gradually grow into something more significant. And then we have to separate, completely separate uh, 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 or divorce certain topics in, in Bosnia in order to actually continue living in Bosnia. Politics and presidency and foreign policy, this is one thing. And what happens on the ground is a completely different matter. If you would ask any citizen of, of Bosnia and Herzegovina what really matters to them, it would be everything but what we discuss at these forums, right? It would be air pollution, it would be uh, economic situation, it would be poor tra transportation system, it would be poor education system, schooling, all sorts of things that are relevant equally in Germany, Switzerland, or Serbia, or anywhere else. And this is something that I, I, I see a tendency that we grew out of it, grew out of discussions of that matter, and we have to go back to that path. At the same time, I want to mention um, something else that happened prior to the elections. We had Dragicevic case, extremely important, and I think very, it, 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 it's, a, it's, a, it's a backbone of something that I see as, as, as this incremental change. It was a protest that happened, uh, that started in Banja Luka six months ago, over the death of a 21-year-old uh, boy or young man, and his father uh, made an oath of himself that he's going to stand in the middle of the city and try to, to seek for justice. And that has grew, grew into, into something much more. It eventually attracted a great number of citizens. It changed election results in Banja Luka, and it can change things. And this is where I also put my hope into, to be honest. Um, we had some, some sparks of revolution here and there in 2014, and that was also violent. And, and, and many were not happy with the outcome or what happened afterwards. But this is where the civil society as a whole, I'm not talking about civil society organizations, I'm talking about civil society as a whole, makes perfect sense, where, where we voice out what matters to us, what we want, and let's begin with basics, we need justice. And this is something that, that might really shape the, the political narrative and political environment in Bosnia, or at least I, I hope for. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Lida, we jump over to Marika Jolai. Marika, your take on the, as a co-opted Bosnian, <laughs> how do you see it? More optimistic or more pessimistic? Is it on? Yeah. Um, thank you very much for co-opting me into uh, Bosnian generous, you know. citizenship <laughs> and, and um, making me part of Bosnia. Um, I'm very happy to be here tonight and to talk about Bosnia because I have been working and living there since on and off since 2004. Um, I was thinking about, about one thing when, you know, as the election results uh, were, coming, uh, were coming in on a super slow pace, which is, which is really um, unusual because afterward, I mean, after all, Bosnia is not so big, so to have to wait for the election results for a very long time really raises a question of the uh, legitimacy of the whole electoral process in Bosnia. Um, but what I wanted to say, uh, focusing on, on the Bosnian presidency, is that it is really interesting that since, you know, the first time since 1996, so in 20 years, Dodik finally decides that um, he needs to move uh, into the state level institution, which is the presidency, which he has never done before. So all his power and everything he, he was doing um, was always based in Republika Srpska. And now he moves into a presidency with motivations. I mean, motivations for him can be different. Um, on the one hand, you know, he's talking about how he's going to focus on the, on the well-being and um, uh, the destiny of Republika Srpska in the future from the position of one of the presidency uh, members. Uh, but then on the other hand, his first time he's put himself, because so far he's been either prime minister or uh, president of Republika Srpska. So first time he's put himself in a position to be in an environment and in a context which is formally, uh, legally different to what he has 
has, has had until now, uh, where he will need to, I mean, he can be defiant, of course, but uh, there are certain rules and there is a certain legal framework for the presidency of Bosnia and Herzegovina, which will um, have impact on, on what he does uh, in the next four years. Even if he doesn't abide by those rules, those rules still exist. And his first time in the position of actually sharing the power, which he hasn't done before in Republika Srpska, in, 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 in the roles that he's been elected to previously in Republika Srpska. And it seemed to me that he, you know, he's continuing business in usual, being him usual self, doing the things that he normally does, saying the things that he normally does, but the reality is, is that it is a rotating presidency and that there will be some limitations of, of, on what he can do or when um, he can do certain things. And as Alida said earlier, um, you know, him talking about um, using the Serbian passport, I think it's really interesting that um, he felt at this point in his political career and where Bosnia is, that he needs to move to the state level to achieve something, whatever, as I said at the beginning, um, whatever his motivation is. But I think that is a development which may, um, may not have much impact, but then on the other hand, it may be uh, it may be changing, you know, roles and rules of how the Bosnian political system on the high level operates. And then I think the other the other uh, really interesting thing was, um, you know, Čović was really upset about not winning the presidency. See that <laughs> he was really uh, very much hoping for, and for him that was a massive blow. Then he did the post. Uh, post-electoral um, moaning campaign, in, if I <laughs> can call it that, about why he wasn't elected. But then a um, couple of days ago, so about seven days after the, after the elections, it actually turns out that uh, he won the Serbian vote in some of the ca cantons uh, in, in, in West Bosnia. So which means Serbs voted for him. Uh, and then he didn't complain about that and he didn't say anything about returning those votes, you know, uh, because they're not national votes and they're not crowd votes. Um, but I think the lesson that we need to uh, look at um, actually uh, from, from his behavior and how people vote is that perhaps irrespective of the Dayton Agreement and how the country is divided, it seems in these elections we can see that the Dayton Agreement ultimately do, does not, and also with Komšić, does not dictate how citizens behave in terms of voting preferences and in terms of voting patterns. And I think we really need to think about that's, that is a key um, point of maybe analysis or engagement and that is what, you know, how do citizens feel and how do they express what they feel. Thank you so much, Marika. Adi. Yes. And that if I may uh, ask you also about the results of local elections in one of a very important cities in Bosnia, Gračanica, uh, where you have some, some ties. No, but this is a serious question as, as, as basically a leader alluded that this kind of a, uh, uh, we have presidency and state institutions, uh, foreign policy and so-called high politics on one hand side and then we have real uh, uh, daily problems that have to be managed, tackled and, and, and basically elaborated on a local level and Gračnica might be one of the interesting examples. But your take on, on the elections and if you yes. have one or two sentences on Gračnica. First of all, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I've received at least, I don't know how many, five per day questions, so what has changed with elections in Bosnia? And immediate answer, well, not, 
that nothing has changed from the person that was actually uh, asking the question. So I always had a counter question, what should have changed? Is it the people that were elected? If that is the answer, then there was a change. We knew it immediately on the first day. We got three new members of the presidency. Two incumbent uh, members of the presidency tried to remain in the presidency. Uh, a Croat and a Serb member of the presidency, they failed. Uh, voters decided that someone else should go instead of them. And the third one is also new because the old one couldn't, couldn't, couldn't join. Uh, second thing, if you look at the preliminary results of the, of the elections at the, at the entity level, at the 10 cantonal levels, uh, you will see that, uh, that the results of certain parties, some parties have weakened, other have became stronger, uh, and some new parties which were established have made uh, uh, significant results, in, in particular in some cantons. Other new, con uh, new uh, parties that were established have failed completely to, to reach out to the voters. Uh, and uh, what else has changed is what has stayed the same but what is something that is missed by many who observe Bosnian politics is that again we have uh, 13 governments to form after the elections and only two small cantons, West Herzegovina and Posavina Canton, can be formed by, with, uh, with a majority of pre-election coalitions. So HDZ has formed a coalition ahead of the elections with seven or eight political parties and they've won more than 50% uh, of votes in two small cantons. In all other cantons at the both entities and the state level, new governments can only be formed with coalitions. There is uh, so, uh, uh, what has started 10 days ago is something that I call three-dimensional chess play in Bosnian politics, which means they try to simultaneously el elect indirect elections to the houses of peoples, then they try to negotiate coalitions for the cantonal levels, then they don't declare that they've agreed at the cantonal levels because they're waiting to agree at the entity level, and I lost you all probably in this room because it's so complicated that many foreigners do not understand it, and many Bosnians, sadly, uh, still, still do not understand, uh, don't understand how it functions. So, if it comes to people, we have 512 new members of, uh, newly elected members of the parliament. We still not officially don't know the names of it, but what I can gather from from the information that I get, quite a lot of new faces. Some old faces have become stronger, which I have followed and which had interesting points. And of course, some of those spoilers that we can call them in Bosnian politics, and those that are annoying, that are frustrating the system, and that are frustrating the political process in Bosnia have either uh, remained as strong as they were before or they became, uh, or they became, uh, or they became uh, stronger. In the canton where I come from, you've mentioned Gracanica in Tuzla canton, uh, we have seen uh, again a shift in, 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 in power uh, in, the, in, a, in a cantonal assembly. Uh, you have SDP again being the strongest party, but still it doesn't have a capacity to form a government on its own, so it needs to go into coalition, into coalition agreement. Now, what I expect and what I hope for in the coming uh, months and what's something what Den Denis and what Alida have, have mentioned is uh, what happens in this three-dimensional chess? Is it a discussion about how we divide ministerial position or does, is there someone who will bring something new at the negotiation table at the discussions? And that is where the federal system that Bosnia and Herzegovina has, the system of and the election law that brings you to the situation that alone a party cannot form a, college, uh, a government, uh, can bring a, a lot of change, that has a potential to bring a lot of change. Because, for example, in Tuzla Canton, you have Nasha Stranka and SDP to, say, uh, to a certain extent. Uh, who have a, a certain uh, s strength in Sarajevo Canton as well. And if they try to introduce a different policies, which they have been announcing in the, pre in the election campaign, to discuss about the issues that Alida has mentioned, then we might see a, a certain shift into uh, then we might see a change not only in people, not only in political parties, but also in the policies that govern, that have governed the, the, the country at different levels. And with that, I will, I will conclude. I think that the biggest challenge for Bosnia today is, is, is to improve the, the, the quality of its governance. Uh, so in order to improve that, it's, uh, the key is what Alida has mentioned, and that is pressure from citizens and pressure from interest group. In Bosnia, there are two uh, best uh, organized interest group, three best organized interest groups in the country. First one are politicians, second one are war veterans, and the third one are usually either education 
people working in education or people working in a, uh, in, a, in a health sector. And they fight for their rights and they fight for, for everything. The problem is that other interests and other interest groups and other, uh, uh, other groups of people uh, are not engaged in a policy development process. So you ha they have access, war veterans, teachers and doctors have access to policy makers and to policy decisions and they influence how the po decisions are made. But and the politicians, of course, but others do not have, such as private businesses, uh, such as uh, people who have interest that the children and people are not killed on our very, very unsafe roads in statistics compared to the EU average, uh, that people who are interested in police actually catching the criminals and judiciary delivering verdicts uh, do not get their say in the process of the decision-making process. And uh, in that sense, and that would be my, my last point, I know you have asked me not to go too much. But, so my last point would be, I think that everything that we have seen since 2013 with the protests of citizens, it, it was Yemen and we had 2014 February protests. We have protests all the time in Bosnia. Either it's because someone was killed on the road and we don't know who it was, either because someone was was killed and declared a suicide, either because there is no medical treatment in the hospital in Sarajevo, and then patients go out to the street and demand that they get the medicine that they deserve. So we see, the, uh, since 2013, I see clearly these pockets of, of it. And I think it's, it's, a pro, it's a learning process. You cannot expect from a country like Bosnia or Herzegovina that is, you know, the focus of pre-election campaign in media was 70% on what, whether Dodik will use Bo Bosnian passport, what Alida mentioned, or not, or whether he will do it by Skype or not. So you cannot expect from a country like Bosnia Herzegovina, a society like Bosnia Herzegovina, to, 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 to learn it in 2013 with the Yemen Burger process or uh, February 2014. We need, we need time and I, think I see it as a process that, that might, that might uh, give some hope. Thanks. Thank you, thank you so much all. I mean, we, we are pretty lucky in this panel because the panel before us, uh, they had that date, 2025. Is there a future? We don't have that date in the panel, so we, have, we are more relaxed in a way. Uh, uh, Thank you so much. I mean, uh, we will probably have some questions in, in the Q&A session and some remarks on, on what has been said right now. Uh, there is one, uh, this is just what I want to add, one big looming question, not only for Bosnia, but for the uh, countries in the region in general, and this is the question of the legitimacy of uh, democratic elections. Now we uh, were not only pretending, but we were treating and regarding democratic elections as certain, one of the most important democratic procedures as something serious. And I'm not quite sure uh, that given the circumstances in specific countries, the control of public opinion, the kleptocratic clientelistic circles that are pushing people to vote for certain options, uh, jokes that uh, we heard in the electoral campaign like uh, uh, in the middle of the campaign, ha ha ha, if you don't vote for me, you're not going to get the job, but this is just a joke. Uh, and then the, 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 the simple fact that uh, almost 50% of the Bosnians haven't voted. Uh, so this is a kind of a bunch of, bunch of issues, so we could also continue discussing the, the legitimacy of democratic elections or undemocratic elections in Serbia, etc., etc. But just to have it and to have it said uh, for the Q&A. Now we go, and Dennis, uh, do you just want to... 20 seconds. As what I want to do in the second step uh, is basically to turn what uh, Alida alluded at, that there are like underlying structural uh, issues and conditions in Bosnia that we need to discuss beyond the political sphere. Uh, and we will uh, try to shed a, cash, shed a light on, 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 on certain topics and, and, and issues, including foreign policy and education and emigration, etc., etc. And I would first like to, to ask uh, Alida Vracic uh, first. Uh, she published this paper on emigration. Uh, and we have the facts and the numbers of young people, not only from Bosnia, but also from Serbia, Macedonia, leaving the countries. Uh, and usually the question is framed as a very, a very negative one, and there is not so much new uh, in trying to find innovative uh, solutions and how to, to make it, uh, in a way, uh, to turn it upside down. So, Lida, uh, looking at Bosnia from that perspective, uh, what is the status quo and what could be a kind of, a, 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 let's say, positive utopian uh, way forward? Well, let me be pretty clear here. Immigration is not only negative mm -hmm. whatsoever. It helped others and it, it, it might also help the region if we think through the, the, the whole concept of immigration. 
Basically, research that I've published speaks about uh, the rates of immigration, how basically they are, they're high and what they impact in return. So what you have in Bosnia, and I have to say it, it's, it's not only Bosnia, it's the whole region, it's also European countries. It's Romania, it's some other countries. Experiencing extremely high rate of people basically leaving the region, departing the region. Some interesting things pop up in this research, and, and one of them is, is going against the usual cliche, against the usual mainstream, that we all think that people are leaving because they're economically challenged, because they have no money and they have no jobs. What's happening with this immigration is that people with money and with solid jobs are also deciding to leave because of other types of reason, one being hopelessness about you know, political environment that something will change. People also leave because they, they cannot rely on services that I so insist on. I've spent years and years discussing things and discussing Bosnia at these conferences. Very often we, we ourselves get trapped by the politics, by the discussion that really doesn't matter in, 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 in central Bosnia. It doesn't matter in Tuzla. It doesn't matter in some rural areas of, of Bosnia and Herzegovina and other places. And immigration is basically uh, uh, um, triggered by the fact that you have uh, only last year and year before, Bosnia has lost 400 highly qualified doctors. What you have in return is young families deciding to leave because now they cannot rely that there is a service for their children if something goes wrong. You have people, uh, highly educated people at universities and, and high schools, even primary schools, they're also leaving. In return, you have people re rethinking concept of education completely because now they have no place to go to actually educate their kids. So this immigration is very, very different from what we normally associate with immigration from the 60s when you had mostly men, mostly farmers, people going abroad and being basically gastarbeiters. Now gastarbeiters are doing pre-qualification in Germany and they're becoming medical workers. So there is a switch. What I said about immigration at the beginning, it's not only negative. Immigration is also transfer of knowledge. It's remittances. It's all sorts of other things that are related to the exposure of those that are actually going somewhere and are able now to, to get back or come back with some new uh, novel concepts and novel ideas. We have seen that a lot. There are cases everywhere in the region when people decide to go back decide to set up their own businesses with completely different mindset. Now they're entrepreneurs. They're, now they're not young people striving to, to become part of the, the, the uh, uh, civil service in, 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 in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but they're something completely different. Immigration also is, um, as I said, it, it's not related only to Bosnia and it could be promoted as a circular immigration. This is the basic thread of the paper. We cannot prevent people to leave. There will always be people that are curious, inquisitive, amazing, well-educated, and they will want to, to leave, to, to actually see something out there. What we can do is actually uh, uh, enable them to anchor themselves back. What that means is that there are all sorts of platforms. We're talking about 60 platforms designed for the Western Balkans, initiated whether from the inside or the outside that are not basically used for this purpose and could be used for this purpose. This is, this is one of the, the propositions that I have also for the EU to focus on, on this particular scheme, to, to connect labor markets in Germany, to connect labor markets in the region. At the moment as we speak here, there are at least, and I'm, I'm not going to exaggerate, there are at least one million open, open posts in Germany. As long as there is this kind of demand on the other side, there's very little our governments are anyway in the first place able to do to prevent people to go because they will always want to go and there are places to, to, to actually go. What we can the very best do is to start by mapping up our diaspora to know where these people are and to try to offer them something meaningful if they're willing to come back. There is a research or, or lots of research being done about uh, the families that are leaving. Once your kids, if you emigrate with your kids, once your kids start school, chances of you coming back are really, really becoming low. So you target very special groups there. You have to be extremely clever how you design your policies. We cannot be further, mo more further away from designing these policies. No one even speaks about it. I mean, I know the Nasha Stranka had some, some really good propositions in this respect, but I haven't seen that has been really like picked up by others and, and created a dynamic, uh, vibrant discussion. In Croatia, that is also part of the European, uh, part of the EU, they also experience extremely, extremely 
very high rate of immigration. Politicians are, are, are almost in, in denial process over it. I mean, we had a uh, president of Croatia going somewhere in Brussels and saying that this whole mobility thing should be re retaught and maybe it's not a good idea actually that we have this possibility to, to go somewhere to travel and educate ourselves. This is crazy. You will not stop anyone who wants to leave. The point is really to offer them a meaningful comeback. Uh, what is closely related to what you mentioned uh, is the issue of education, uh, the educational opportunities and, and basically also the pitfalls in, in, in education. Uh, Marika, uh, would you uh, like to, to, to take this issue of education in Bosnia as one of us, I mean this is now not that political uh, at the first sight, but it is uh, very political when you just look uh, deeper into it. Uh, can you uh, share with us a few thoughts uh, on the educational sector in Bosnia? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, you know, when I, when I was doing uh, research for my PhD, um, I did a household survey in two small um, towns in Bosnia and Herzegovina, one in southern Herzegovina, Stolac, and one in northern Bosnia, in Kotrvaros. Uh, and then one of the typical questions at the end of each survey is how many years of, primary, of education or schooling do you have? Um, and then when I started going through this data, I realized that um, a large number of my uh, uh, survey respondents um, had eight years of schooling and many of them less and I was really surprised to discover this. So then I started looking into, um, you know, into levels of, of education in Bosnia and Herzegovina because ultimately education is about human capital and human capital as we know is something that um, really determines socio-political but also economic uh, processes um, in a country. Um, and then, for example, um, that is something that is not receiving a lot of, um, a lot of attention from the policy makers. Uh, but the truth is that in Bosnia and Herzegovina, according to the last survey, um, there are 146,000 people, uh, citizens of Bosnia and Herzegovina, 15 years and older, who have no education at all. At eight, and 83.5 percent of this number are women. And then uh, there are uh, about double the amount, the, the number of people who uh, have incomplete primary education and again uh, just under 70 percent of, of uh, this number of uh, citizens of Bosnia and Herzegovina are women. And then there is a further number of um, of around 640,000 citizens of Bosnia and Herzegovina who have only primary school. Um, and looking at these uh, numbers, um, which te they tell us that roughly about 12% of citizens of Bosnia and Herzegovina, 15 years and older, lack education and then 18% uh, have all only primary school. And um, we know that, uh, for example, education affects um, voting preferences, um, it affects uh, electoral, electoral behaviors, it affects um, social norms and roles, how people behave in their everyday life. Uh, so this is something which is uh, extremely important. So on, on, on the one hand, we have, as the leader was talking about, uh, people who emigrate and leave Bosnia and Herzegovina. But then on the other hand, you have a situation where people in Bosnia and Herzegovina, citizens of, of the country, they're lacking basic education. On top of that, uh, there is still uh, discrimination um, in, in the education, access to education system in Bosnia and Herzegovina in Federation. There's still uh, two schools under one roof, which means that uh, children of Croatian nationality and, and Bosnian nationality attend to different cu curriculums. 
but they also go to attend uh, separate classes in separate classrooms, in separate uh, parts of the building. And about four years ago, the um, Supreme Court of, uh, of Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina ruled that these schools are unconstitutional, but they're still existing. So for example, in Stolets, in, um, in one of the places where I did my field work. Um, and all these, you know, all this in combination. So it's not about, just about um, who, you know, who are the people who leave and, and uh, uh, what happens to, to them in the future and whether they stay attached to, to their own country or not. But it is also a big question about people who stay in country and whether and what kind of capacity they have to influence the future of their country. If they're lacking education, if there is a, a ethnic segregation, if there are 14 different education ministries in Bosnia and Herzegovina on different governance level as they are, if they're not respecting decisions and implementing decisions, core decisions about access uh, to education, if they can't agree about a uniform national cur curriculum for all the children in Bosnia and Herzegovina, it really raises a massive question about how capable they will be to grasp the challenges of um, politics, economy, um, and ultimately everyday life in future Bosnia and Herzegovina and not just in terms of um, acting as citizens but also in terms of understanding and especially what really shocked me is you know this this data showing that um, girls for example are still uh, receiving less education in Bosnia and Herzegovina so if you if you look at the mean uh, years in education, girls are receiving about two and a half years less of education than boys. And uh, from my experience and what I, I researched, I know that a uh, number of these girls come from rural areas where you have um, only four years of, of first five years of primary school in the local village and then the parents either can't afford to send them to the nearby town to commute every day or their you know religious reasons or social norms or they simply economic reasons and they need to stay at home to to work and to help around the household uh, but this really you know the problem of um, people being educated to the level that they're able to engage actively with the, with the life in, um, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, um, really, and, and, and the failure of the politicians to engage with this issue in the right way really um, should raise a lot of concerns about when talking about the future of Bosnia and what's the way forward. I think this is one of the main uh, issues that we need to look at. Thank you. Thank you so much. As what we learn, not only when we discuss Bosnia, but whatever we discuss, we learn that the time is much, much faster than we are, uh, and 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 the time at Belgrade Security Forum is marching forward. Uh, just a quick reply by 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 a reaction by Alida. Thirty seconds, and then Denis Graz. Uh, uh, on several issues, but I believe also on, on the relationship between Bosnia and Serbia and a and, 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 and few more moments. So, Alida, just a quick... Just super briefly. Yeah. Um, regarding the education, actually, immigration here, crazily somehow, has a positive effect, and here's how. There was a brilliant survey being done where basically uh, explains once you have a model that is successful model. So imagine a, a small village where you have three doctors that succeeded becoming good doctors at clinics in Germany. What you have in return is, is children and, and others basically educating themselves to come to that level. 
So they pursue German languages, German language or other languages, they pursue additional education, they want certificates, they want everything they can get. And in reality what happens is that many of them don't leave. So you basically increase the capacities within the community one way or the other just by looking at some successful examples out there. I have a feeling like we kind of missed the point of the, I, I, when I listen to my colleagues, uh, I, I, have, I get this feeling that we are talking about a very sophisticated analysis of the symptoms of the disease that sort of uh, uh, ravages Bosnia and Herzegovina or has been destroying the country for the 25 years, but we don't see the big picture. And the big picture is for the third time at least in the past 20 years in these elections, we have people getting out to vote 51% of them, which is far more considering that many of the registered people actually left the country, which also tells us, you know, what their opinion about uh, the voting process and the election process. Uh, and we have people voting, and when you see the numbers, yes, SDA and HDZ and SNSD, they won the elections, but when you see the numbers, people resent the system that is based on ethnic division and each to their own. This is what people have demonstrated for several times, 2002, 2010, and now again 2018. We talk, and this is, and this is actual, the actual problem of Bosnia and Herzegovina is that it cannot function as a parliamentary democracy, whereas it has inherited the system of ethnic divisions on every level. And you are not going to be able to, to, to solve that uh, by targeting particular issues of education, I don't know, economic development or anything else, as long as you haven't solved the issue of uh, uh, people feeling not being presented because they voted for left, I don't know, green or right or anyhow, but that because that limits them to, you know, to be identified as voted either for Bosnia, Croat and Serb. And for the, uh, uh, I, I don't know how long is this going to last that, um, um, you know, and we get so tired, I personally get so tired in fighting the fight of uh, uh, developing a system where um, your basic right to vote or your basic right to participate and to live in the country is not going to be based on your ethnic background or your religious background, but on the very fact that you are uh, you know, the citizens of, uh, the citizens of Bosnia and Herzegovina. And we see that very much, uh, um, you know, uh, we have the, the Croat issue with Komšić being attacked in this case by being elected by Bosnian quotes. But we never ask ourselves whether the Bosniaks who have voted for Komšić voted for, them, for him because he was Croat or anti-Croat or Bosniak or anything else. It limits you constantly to your ethnic background. And it won't work. It won't work. It, it, it's going to destroy the country. This is, the, this is the tough question each time we discuss Bosnia. Uh, we, we basically know what the underlying uh, problem uh, is. And then there is this strong kind of ethno-political accord inscribed into the, into the, into the tissue of Bosnia. Uh, but then at the same time, and that was a kind of a way by trying to discuss like certain challenges and, and options to move forward, uh, even a kind of a recognition that basically uh, the political system as it is, is set in stone and we have to try to move forward somewhere else. Uh, but then your, your point is basically no way. So Bosnia can move incrementally from one step to another, but as long as we have this ethnocratic uh, 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 rule and the system based of, 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 net, of ethnicity, uh, we will not move uh, towards that decisive goal that we want to have. And this is, uh, at the same time, as we will, we will discuss it again in the Q&A, definitely. Uh, this is what I uh, want to ask Adi. So Adi, uh, usually, and back like 10 years ago, 15 years ago, uh, many have hoped that the international community and then the European Union is going to bring about the change. Change the constitution, uh, put the pressure on political elites, uh, uh, tell them and push them towards starting behaving, reforming, etc., etc. Uh, and my question would be: uh, 
first of all, can we still hope that the uh, European Union and the Brussels, this kind of a process from Dayton towards Brussels, and we have been traveling from Dayton towards Brussels for almost uh, one and a half decades, and we haven't come f uh, um, uh, that far. Uh, so, uh, basically, how would you uh, uh, see the role of the European Union right now following the elections? And is there any way that some international actors could pressure the Bosnian political elites and create some kind of a momentum towards what uh, uh, Denis was uh, mentioning, uh, creating a different, uh, even constitutional environment uh, for, for a moment that you have citizen and citizens' votes uh, uh, accounting as they should in a democratic state. Uh, let, thank you. Uh, I think when we discuss about people leaving and when we discuss this issue, I think it's, it's, of course it's important to have the programs for them to come back and all the positive aspects that Alida has mentioned, I fully agree and, and are under under radar in discussions of, of coming back. But I think when, when we discuss about that issue, I think it's, it's maybe more important to discuss what happens to those who stay. Because if we look at countries like Estonia and Bulgaria, for example, we will see that both in Estonia and Bulgaria, a significant portion of population has left the country before they joined the EU, after they joined the EU, and it comes back to what Alida said, you cannot stop, stop people from leaving. But even in this room, I think we would all agree that uh, those who live in Estonia live much better, have a, a, a much better quality in the standard of living than in Bulgaria. And I would argue that people in Bulgaria have a much better standard of living than, 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 the, people, than the people in Bosnia. So it comes down to what happens to, to those this day. And in that sense, I would like to read you a short quote from an article from a newspaper. It says, uh, when our people go abroad, they're all they're all good and disciplined workers. Clearly, there's something wrong here. There is a strong prejudice or dogma that no public job should be lost. Many ambitious and hard-headed young people seem to have accepted the following guidelines. First, make sure of the best qualification available for you. Second, join the party. Third, use family and other connections in order to get a job in a well-paying and dynamic uh, enterprise. Finally, do not work too hard, but to reserve your energies for political and semi-political activities which bring you into contact with influential people. This is a description of a Yugoslav society from 1982. It's from a, a newspaper's Barba. And I ask you here how much in our perception of how our society in Bosnia-Herzegovina, but also your society here in Serbia or wherever you come from the region, has changed uh, in that sense. Which brings me to the question of the structures. I think that we uh, too often focus on structures when it comes to Bosnia and searching for the, uh, for the, for the results of the, of the failed policies. I'm not saying that Bosnian constitution is not complicated. I'm not saying that actors who are involved in a political process in Bosnia and Herzegovina are not frustrated, some for good reasons, some for bad reasons, some play to be frustrated, others are actually frustrated. But what I'm saying is that uh, we uh, that our problems run much deeper than the structures. They, they run into this aspect of how we perceive what the, uh, what the, what the, what the governments or what, how the governance, uh, how the governance should, should look like. In that sense, I think that the most important segment is what I already said, uh, citizens in our countries and interest groups in our countries that we have just started to build. When I say interest groups, I don't mean typical lobby groups, Brussels style, or etc. I mean really hearing the concerns and interests of different groups in our societies and trying to bring compromise uh, between them. Uh, and the second, uh, back to your question, what the role of the EU is, I think that the role of EU is to have a clarity of language. And if they turn to clarity of language of what is actually happening uh, with what uh, America has explained, all the problems, uh, has explained a lot of challenges that the education system in, in Bosnia has. But the question is, why do our parents uh, who are engaged in, who, whose children are engaged in the education problem, uh, do not demand and do not get better education? I also say, federal system in Bosnia also provides opportunity. It shouldn't just be seen as an obstacle. In a sense, after these elections, if 
for example, Nasha Stranka would take over, it could take over education portfolio in Canton Sarajevo or in, in, in Canton Tuzla and be fully responsible for the education system in these two because they're fully independent. Something that with the current election results at the federation level or at the state level, they couldn't do because their capacity there is much weaker than, than at, at the cantonal level. So I think that uh, changing structures, and that will be my last point, changing structures in Bosnia Herzegovina with the current level of policy debate that I've just, I've just read to you article from, from 1982, uh, I think it's, 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 it's not going to happen tomorrow, but the problems that we have that Marika has described when it comes to education, that Alida has described uh, when it comes to number of doctors that we have and the quality, those problems we can tr start solving today. Uh, and there are recipes to solve it. Uh, and EU, in all of these, in many of these aspects, would have a, a, a say through a much clearer language. Let's just go back to the initial panel and to the first panel and PREBA report. Uh, and, uh, and the power that the PREBA report and the description of how the surveillance system in Macedonia has worked had not only on citizens in Macedonia and the public in Macedonia, but also on policymakers across. European Union and, uh, and uh, uh, on the other side, on the other side of, of, of the Atlantic. Uh, just imagine if you would have a PREBA report for the, survey, uh, for the secret service in Serbia and us actually discovering how and what they do and how much would dealing with that help uh, overall regional stability, something that Bosnia-Herzegovina, for example, has went through through reform of, of intelligence, intelligence service, uh, by the way. So there is a role for EU, but EU ha needs to recognize all these processes that happen at the, at the, at the level of the citizens, and it needs to uh, also recognize, to a certain extent, something that has already been recognized, that changing structures in Bosnia-Herzegovina is difficult, because also uh, you need to convince others, and that is maybe back to the point of the elections. Anyone who wants to change the election law, anyone who wants to change the constitution, needs to convince others in Bosnia and Herzegovina to lead, to help them or to to, count, to join them in that change. And that is a difficult, a, a, a difficult task. Okay, we should we should we should not start uh, con uh, counting how uh, often uh, all of you have uh, by the end of the debate have mentioned like the word difficult, uh, uh, <laughs> complicated, uh, but uh, it's. Uh, quite frequently is used in debates uh, when we speak about the Bosnian political system and how to, how to move forward. Then it's just a short, a short remark because I would like to, to open yes. up uh, uh, for a few of your questions and then bring it back to the panel. Dennis. And it's very late in the evening. Uh, I mean, uh, we must also f uh, maybe emphasize the positive aspects mm -hmm. of this country existing after a terrible war some 20 years later. Uh, it's an unusually stable. It's unusually stable in a very unstable environment. Mm -hmm. It is very, very, very effective in collecting taxes. <laughs> it is, you know, compared to some other countries that introduced VAT, you know, value-added tax and, 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 and stuff like that. So the state is functioning where it wants to function, mm -hmm. but it is not on behalf of the people. So when we discuss the issues of Bosnia and Herzegovina, we always tackle solutions that are not necessarily for the benefit of the Bosnian people. And I, I, I see, you know, I try to sort of uh, observe this from the regional point of view. We are here in Belgrade, we talk about security. When we, you know, discuss border changes, for example, when we discuss Kosovo-Serbia issues, any changes of borders, in this region concerns Bosnia and Herzegovina, for example. And no one talks about the people, or you know, it is not interested on the people. And then at the same time, we have a very divisive system that prevents the people of actually expressing what they want. Because every two years or four years, they are being asked in the elections, what kind of country do they want? But within a system, that actually prevents them from the realization of what they want. You know, imagine a situation where all people, all citizens of Bosnia and Herzegovina would be able to elect all three or four or five members of collective presidency. What kind of rhetorics would that be? You know, a Dodik would probably, if he had to rely on the votes from the Federation, would maybe have to soften up a little bit. 
And, and you know, I'm talking about the, the, the electoral system and the division. And when I see constitutional changes and it has to change and it's very difficult, I don't mean necessarily, you know, embarking on changing the Dayton Constitution so you know, people feel threatened. I'm not saying that. But I'm talking about really pushing the changes there where people want them to see. On the local level, Nasha Stanka or other parties, I don't know, or nationalist parties, they do very well because it's very viable and it's connected to the people. On the national level, it all relates to three guys fighting over, you know, whether they are legitimated or not through the votes which are identified only by the ethnic background and people resent it. As the, I, I'm going to give you the numbers for the Federation, I'm going to finish there. SDA won 140,000 votes in the Federation. Uh, second party was the SDP with 140,000. Then was uh, uh, the Front, Democratic Front with 90,000. And then Nasha Stanka with 60,000 of those non-nationalist parties. So obviously, people vote non-nationalist. Not because they like much more the left, or the, so because, but because they resent the nationalist policy. Because it takes their children away out of the country. And when we talk education, and when we talk about immigration, and how to facilitate this, we talk about a country that is dying out. We are the oldest society in Europe, and we are facing structural problems of financing our uh, rent, uh, um, pensions and whatnot because people are giving up on a country that is not serving the people. So if you want to help Bosnia, you know, if you want to discuss the stability of Bosnia, then you have to start discussing the uh, 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 relationship of Belgrade to Sarajevo, not to Bel Banja Luka, to Sarajevo and the relationship of Zagreb to Sarajevo and what kind of country they want to have in the middle of, of the region. And then we can start discussing. Speaking, speaking about a superstructure that prevents someone from doing something, uh, and now I stand in a position uh, that I have to prevent you from saying what you want because one of my panelists doesn't want to be prevented from saying what she wants to say. No, no, Alida, just for a second, I want to give you a, a, the mic back. Uh, 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 just a short, short comment and then we go to your comments in, in, in Q&A. Just super briefly. Yeah. What Dennis has described, this, this other way of, of, of choosing uh, outside of ethnic uh, uh, lines that we normally have, would be meaningless if we still have three people in presidency that are uninterested in changing one bit of the story, right? So changing structure, going back to what Adi said, changing structure is one thing and what we can already do under the given structure is something completely different. We are doing My it. view is that we can do much more. We're growing for the past 10 years. No, not but you, but I'm talking about citizens. I'm talking about the, 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 the possibilities on the ground. And at the same time, you also have, uh, you will find often people overcoming completely this, this, this ethno, ethno, ethno narrative doing very simple things. In Sarajevo we have Catholic school center, right? It's, it's run by the, the, by the Catholic church. It's one of the most competitive places for schooling. And most, most pupils that are actually enrolling there are Bosniaks. Once you have something good in offer, I would argue that that basically changes completely the dynamic of what matters to whom and who would go after his own whatever tribe. That's the only thing. Thank, thank you, Alida. So, uh, now to you. Uh, I see uh, at least 15, 20 to 25 hands, not so many, but uh, a few. Uh, let's, let's, uh, I would suggest to collect simply a set of questions and then we bring it back to the panel and try to answer it quickly. Milan Nietzsche, in the, as, as he's like sitting so nicely in the first row, <laughs> you can kick it off. Thank you, Vedran. Milan Nietzsche now uh, with the German Council on Foreign Relations in Berlin. Uh, I don't know whether you did a good thing of choosing me the first, but I will say one comment and then challenge you with a question. And the comment is that I find it very interesting that you haven't mentioned the international community as the other factor in the Bosnian-Herzegovinian future. 
and it's important. You haven't mentioned it also because I would argue that from 2006, when you had a moment of truth in Bosnia and Herzegovina with the April package to change the constitutional arrangement, it didn't go through. It was very close, maybe two votes in the federation part of the assembly. But ever since it was downhill. And now the question. In these, in these days, we have April packet type of situation in another Balkan country in Macedonia. Now, in BSF, we don't have a separate panel on Macedonia. But I want to challenge you and ask you to comment from your Bosnian experience the current developments around the name issue in Macedonia and also the current discussion about the land swap between Serbia and Kosovo and what implications it could have on the situation in Bosnia and Herzegovina, which is always referred to as the backbone of the Balkans. And I think there is a certain, you know, certain train of thought saying that you can isolate the Serbian Kosovo issue from the rest of the Balkans and from Bosnia in particular. And I want to provoke you a little bit and say that the, arguments, the argument goes along the lines that if two leaders and agree, you know, why should internationals that have failed in Bosnia challenge that, some internationals. But I want to recall also the fact that there was an agreement about two leaders about Bosnia-Herzegovina early in the war situation between Milosevic and Tuđman, which was not the best one, which was wrong agreement. And it had to be challenged because it was a wrong way to go. And, and therefore, I think if Vucic and Taci agrees, let's put aside if Kosovo can even pass that agreement, if, if they are divided or not. But if that is wrong for the region, I think the region has a stake and Bosnia has a stake. Uh, th thank, uh, thank, thank you. So, several questions, uh, but you are completely on our path. Uh, uh, Sonja Licht is sitting here. What we wanted basically to suggest for the next Belgrade Security Forum is to have a panel with only Bosnians sitting on it commenting the regional situation. <laughs> uh, no, uh, I'm uh, back to, the be to, to being serious. Uh, that would be an interesting panel, by the way. Uh, so we have uh, a gentleman uh, here, and then I see several more hands. So please. Thank you very much for a very interesting panel. My name is Brian Ebel from the Canadian Embassy. We can look at the situation in Bosnia-Herzegovina today and we can correctly describe it as relatively stable. We can also look at the same phenomena and describe it as complete stagnation. The country has been on a downward track for the last 10 years or longer uh, without any possibility of escape. We fool ourselves by talking about the, the recent elections in Bosnia as if it's going to lead to change. If we look at uh, the likelihood of outcomes, as Alida mentioned, outcomes that will lead to concrete benefits for citizens, the prospects seem uh, very small indeed. Now, Alida, you mentioned that change will come incrementally. And Adnan, uh, you mentioned that um, uh, change will take time. Is that change, in fact, even possible within the Dayton, the, the Dayton constitutional structure that is self-crippling and where we have a political elite overlaid on top of that structure, which to a large extent is selfish, self-interested and self-serving. Uh, gentleman in the, in the uh, sir, young gentleman in the third row, yes, it's you. Hello, hello. Uh, well, three things. First of all, welcome to Belgrade. No, they're brief. Well, one is a question, two are very brief. Uh, the second thing is a comment on some of the things I've heard. Well, it's a word of pray for, praise for the Bosnian people, Bos Bosanci Hercegovci. We all understand each other. And that is that they finally understood what the West already knows, that local and national are not the same thing. Who cares who is the president, uh, the mayor of Srebrenica, if he's a, a Muslim or a Bosniak, a Serb or a Croat, if he's doing good for the citizens there within his authorities. But, however, then this, this is where we disagree, 
uh, and I come to my question. Um, you said, uh, you spoke a lot about democracy and legitimacy. Well, I think that anything that the three, three peoples in Bosnia agree on is democratic because we rarely agree on anything. But uh, the last thing I remember that we agreed on was the Dayton Agreement. And my question is, are you worried about the lack of democracy in some parts of the Dayton Agreement and the implementation itself? I'm specifically referring to two situations. For example, the Dayton Agreement, which was signed by a Serb in the name of the Serbs in Bosnia, was changed by, an, by a man or several people which were not elected, which were appointed. And that's not democratic, at least in my opinion. And the second thing is the election of Komšić right now. I mean, we all know it says a Croat, a Serb, and a Bosniak. I don't know if it was changed to Bosniak at the time, but Bosniak. And yes, he is a Croat, and that is true, but the point of it was that the Croats elect their own representative. And I know that the, the division in the Federation doesn't exactly allow only the Croats to vote for one spot, but I mean, it's not democratic that the, the, the Bosniaks select one, and it's not democratic that the Serbs in, in Bosnska Krajina get to vote on that too, per the Dayton Agreement. So my question was, are you concerned with that lack of d democracy in electing a Croat by non-Croats? and changing the Dayton Agreement without any type of democracy, but by the Office of the High Representative, or whatever it's yeah. called. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Th this, is, this is then going uh, very deep. I mean, the question, who is the true Croat, who is the wrong Croat, who is the true Serb in Serbia, who is the wrong Serb, et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, I mean, uh, we, will, we will bring it back to the panel. Kurt, uh, a, a quick question, comment. Kurt Bazrena here in the... Thank you. Kurt Pessiner, Democratization Policy Council. Two quick questions, but they're quick. About the demonstrations, uh, the Dragicevic demonstrations, which to my mind are the, the most positive evolution because you have, you have a moral leader that's recognized as such. It's cross-ethnic. You had a 24-kilometer tailback of people trying to get the Doughboy from the Federation to stop by RS police. That's a big deal. Um, I'd like to get your, the panel's view on, on how they see that developing after the elections, if they see it developing, or whether people are too enervated by another, you know, de pseudo-democratic process. And then voter lists and fraud. I mean, you have a million more voters registered now than there were in 2002, and there are not a million more people in Bosnia-Herzegovina than there were in 2002. So you're at a, a Macedonia-level situation where you probably have more people on the voter list than you have physically in the country on any given day. Um, I'd like to get your view on how much electoral fraud there probably was baked into the process and uh, how, what avenues you might see to, be, to try to remediate that if there are any institutional avenues. Is there one more question I would like to take? Yes, mm -hmm. there's a gentleman here. Well, hello, my name is Dan Kozul. I'm a journalist of Sarajevo-based federal television, public service. I want to ask you, we are sitting here on the Belgrade Security Forum, so like we are sitting in the place of the leader of regional stability. Yeah, but we all know how huge damage Belgrade and Serbia, how huge potential of damage there is. So I want to ask you, how do you see the role of Zagreb and Belgrade, especially in this pre-election campaign? And not just pre-election campaign, not just when we speak about the elections, but generally. Do you see it maybe as a better situation that Belgrade and Zagreb give up their hands from Bosnia on somehow? Do you think that inside of Bosnia there will be better chance for some kind of solution, or this is just the way the things will go till the end of the world. I don't know. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. Several sets of questions. Uh, we are not going to go until midnight, uh, uh, which we'll need to in order to answer them all. But I, no, I mean, what we need, discipline, discipline, discipline. Now uh, we have to uh, try to be disciplined on the, on the panel. If I, uh, we will start somewhere in the middle and they go to the left and to the right. Uh, if I uh, can ask you just like, Two minutes, uh, and you pick and choose one or two uh, comments, and uh, 
we obviously cannot all answer all the questions. So Adi, if you would like to start, then Dennis and we go to the ladies. Then. The issue with, sorry, the, the issue with, uh, let me link two questions. The issue with Komšić and Čović and the struggle how to elect the, the Croat representative in the presidency is closely linked to discussion on the, on the border swaps. Not linked in the sense of, of link, but it's, it's, it's basically the same thing. Uh, Federation is, is one entity. It has ten cantons. It has two mixed cantons. It's impossible to draw a line between Croatian population, Croat population and Bosniak population in the Federation. In order to have Croat voters uh, vote, elect one member in Federation and Bosnia, uh, let's not even call them Croat and, and Bosnia, let's say uh, areas where Bosniaks are dominantly living and areas where Croat are dominantly living, you have to draw a line. Drawing borders between ethnicities in our country of Bosnia and Herzegovina and the region has proven to lead to wars, blood and other things because it's high, highly difficult. It goes into Mahalas, it goes to the Komšiluks and, it's, and then when you figure out, when two leaders sit and say, okay, let's draw a line and they agree to draw a line, then they say, okay, but where's the line? And the line cannot be agreed because it's, you know, buildings, etc., etc. Then what happens is in order for the other to accept and to, for the two leaders to, to agree, you need to create circumstances on the ground for the both leaders to accept what, what the, other, the other wants. And that's what leads you to war, and that's what leads you to mass expulsions, and that's what leads you to, to genocide, to create the situation. Other option to do that is to register voters as either Croat or Bosniak voters. And if we look at the European Convention on Human Rights and other legal aspects, you cannot in, you, it, it would be impossible to, f to get a majority in the parliament to register me as either a Bosniak, Croat, or, uh, not, or a Serb, or some, some, some other. And that's where the problem. And th in that sense, it's very close to, to, to the discussion about border corrections between Kosovo and Serbia, because it's the same, it's the same, same, same logic is behind. It's the same how it is impossible, and it leads to the same consequences. And that is, you want to create circumstances on the ground, because people who sit in Belgrade or in Pristina actually do not know uh, how the, the Mahalas and how the Komšiluks, uh, Komšiluks looks, uh, look in, the, uh, in, in different villages. I think I already used two minutes, but I would like to say one thing on... on um, um, Yes, if I maybe maybe come, can come back to, to, to I think yeah I think I, I mean uh, listen when it comes to when it comes to Macedonia I think it's I, I always tell that to my friends from Macedonia it's a 2006 April amendments moment you have people you have Merc, you had a lineup of, of politicians from the West coming showing interest giving hand and trying to, to push a certain agreement that uh, should bring you a step forward if you don't use the chance you will probably maybe who knows it, there's never you know. It's difficult to say, but you might end up uh, like Bosnia, ending up in uh, 10 years after sitting and not having discussed at all the role of, of international community and whether they can help or not because they don't want to, to help because they don't know if they, if, 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 if they can help or how they, uh, they can help. Uh, just, yeah, I have to stop. You have to, to, the next comment has to be during the wine session afterwards. So Dennis, your take. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll try to address thing, things, Komšić, Tagičević and the fraud. Uh, you know, it's quite interesting. Uh, I, I understand the frustration, especially of the crowd people in West Herzegovina, a feeling that they are not being represented by Komšić, who by every right is a crowd, and you can't deny it. I mean, uh, the very fact the Constitution allows him to candidate. But the interesting point is that he won over Čović, not because he was in his, obviously, with a large proportion of Bosniak votes, considering the setup of the Federation, but not because he was anti-Croat or pro-Bosniak, but because he, people felt he did represent the entirety of the citizenry of the Bosnian people, which is the very, very re, uh, 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 purpose of the presidency. Now, there are two solutions to this issue. If you really want to secure that HDZ, that obviously has been winning elections uh, where the crowd population does uh, constitute the majority is let's elect the members of the presidency uh, 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 through the parliament. Let's do that indirectly because through the seats in the parliament you will make sure that it is the member of the HDZ, the proper crowd. But 
have in mind that the politics of presupposing that people are like minions, like only Bosniaks, only Croats, only Serbs, it does not work. Head of Naša Stranka is a Serb from Sarajevo. Ivo Komšić, Croat, was the mayor of, of Sarajevo from a social democratic union. Milan Dunovic from Komšić's party, DF, was the vice president Serb of the federation. People elect these people and give them support because they feel they do not only represent one ethnic group. So we have a very strong support of those parties and those political sort of uh, uh, um, uh, storm, storms that want to move away from being only represented based on the ethnic background. Uh, the other solution is uh, uh, very simply make it all one election unit and have all the candidates compete for all the votes in the entire country. You'll see how unbelievably the, the, the rhetorics change when you have to rely, because there is a discrimination. You know, there are around 100 more thousand Serbs living in the Federation that are not able to elect the Serb member of presidency. No one talks about them. No one talks about them being discriminating. Them, them being not legitimized to, to, to have their, their guy elected. So uh, uh, that's the other solution. Dragicevic, unbelievable. It is uh, something again happened like after the, the, the floods that cross borders, that, that destroys the narrative of ethnic division and hatred in the country. You have people support other people just because they feel passionate about their destinies. I, th I see there the potential. There is, and we, you know, th there is a, a, a strong capacity of this country to succeed if we start to treat it as, as a country that deserves to be treated like Denmark, where an abstract citizen is an abstract citizen equipped with all his rights, not because he or she is a Croat Serb or, or Bosniak, because, but because he or she is a Danish citizen. Uh, fraud. It's unbelievable the number of, of, of uh, votes that, are, that were deemed illegal, and, and we are obviously fighting it, but um, it just shows you, it is, uh, um, I see that as an optimistic sign. Considering the fraud and the uh, uh, involvement uh, of, of the institutions in sort of engineering the election results, quite obviously and very rudely, uh, obviously, people uh, uh, started to boycott the system and people started to vote differently than what the nationalist leaders sort of expected. I'm sorry. Thank you. Marika, your quick take on, 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 on 17 questions. But take one, I will, most important for you. I will try to be... Um, I will try to be quick. Uh, first on uh, uh, Milan's uh, question about international community, um, I think uh, I call it uh, their participation in, in life and uh, state of Bosnia and Herzegovina um, maintains this condition of stable unresolvedness, you know, because it's stable enough to, that we didn't have uh, repeating of uh, war violence for 20, more than 20 years. But then on the other hand, it's not stable enough for the international community to live. Um, and it's probably the case more of creating this perception that Bosnia can't, and Herzegovina can't uh, function without international community. Perhaps it's ca it can. Uh, so definitely the question for the future is whether we have finally come to the point that uh, politicians and people who are uh, citizens of Bosnia uh, through their representatives should actually ask international community to leave and see what happens. Um, on the point of um, is the change possible, um, I think uh, what, what you really need to think about and we, what we haven't mentioned here, and this is also related to um, Dragicevic uh, uh, demonstration that we witnessed, um, you know, 
people, citizens of Bosnia and Herzegovina and people who live in Bosnia and Herzegovina have this incredible resilience to deal with adversities of everyday life, very complex everyday life in Bosnia and Herzegovina and in the environment of the countries around Bosnia and Herzegovina as well, despite all the challenges, they manage to live, to get schooling, to work, to marry. Uh, some of them move abroad, some of them stay, but it is definitely, um, we can see that they don't despair, they don't give, an, you know, they don't give into this uh, what they would have right to do um, um, some um, d deeply negative feelings, but they persist and they move on, they come out in, uh, at, to elections, uh, turn out is more than 50%, so there is definitely uh, a very strong ground for the change which rests with people, with the new generations of Bosnia and Herzegovina, and even if we don't see the political outcome that we would like to see and that we think is going to bring better future for Bosnia and Herzegovina, I would definitely say that we need to have more trust in people, in who they are and how they are, how they behave and how they carry all the challenges. Um, and I think as Dennis mentioned, uh, solidarity is really strong among the citizens of Bosnia and Herzegovina and we have seen that after the war in helping each other, um, in uh, responding to different crises in the past 20, 25 years, uh, solidarity doesn't fail. It's just the lack of understanding on the part of the leaders of how to grasp that solidarity and turn it into something um, that would be more engaging in terms of the country's uh, future destiny. And just finally answer to your question about uh, Belgrade and Zagreb, you know, they're not going away. They're going to stay where they are um, as they always have been. But um, the, the, the point about um, regional dynamics and they're always going to maintain interest in Bosnia and Herzegovina but with focus on some of the issues that we discussed here tonight, um, there, is, there should be hope and investment in the possibility of developing dynamics and circumstances where the leaders of Serbia and Croatia um, and their counterparts in Bosnia and Herzegovina are going to start um, using different language which is not going to be at least um, so destabilizing um, as it is now. Thanks, Marika. And now, our leader for the. I mean, what, what you don't see and I see is this clock uh, in, in, in front of me that creates some kind of tension. Uh, but still. Uh, <laughs> I'm right. Okay. Oops. No, you have. You have. You okay. Have. So, very quickly, first question first to the gentleman from the embassy. Is there a way forward with the current elites? I think it's, it's we have to be, uh, I, I feel your frustration, trust me, very much so. But you have to go back a little bit in time and think about what this country has gone through. And if you think about it, only two decades ago there was a bitter war, neighbors killed neighbors. And have we come a long way since? Yes, in that respect, very much so. Do we need more stealth for reforms? Oh my God, like yes, so much. Do we have it? Not so much. Do we have leaders that are promising this kind of agenda? I don't see it as much. But I also don't see the point uh, uh, being focused that much on, on faces. Why? Because in 2014, after we had a series of protests, there were changes in Tuzla Canton, for example. There were changes in the government here and there. What we didn't have is people with visions, people with ideas, people, visionaries that actually have an idea on how to change things. This is what we completely lack. I don't see, I, I probably have met every single politician in Bosnia. I haven't heard a single one laying out a meaningful vision for Bosnia in the next 10 years. This is the thing. 
unless we have people that could really articulate where and how they see things being implemented with really concrete ideas and not these abstract concepts, I don't think we, it, 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 it's pointless to have this discussion about certain faces that are changing here and there. That brings me to another thing, Komšić. I don't know if I would necessarily agree that Komšić was elected because he was representing throughout the, the ethnicities. Perceived. Perceived. I, I, I don't know if, I, if I'm really on, on, on the same page there because I do think he was, um, he was maybe seen as someone who does less harm than Čović at the time. And he had himself mandates where he could have done all sorts of things that simply did not happen. I recently listened to an interview by, by a great author, Martina, and she basically said that uh, no, there was no one single instance, and maybe someone will correct, maybe that's not true, but she said that there was no one single instance where Komšić actually went to West Herzegovina and visited these people. So how to have this connection, how to come across as a legitimate representative. I think there, there was still lots of work on his side to be done that he failed to do. Uh, Ondra Gicevic, oh my God, was that a story? It, it, it is a story. It's, it's, um, what I'm hoping after the elections, I don't know if the morale is, is a little bit down after the elections because I think Beneluca was really hoping to get a somewhat different results. What I'm hoping personally and, and also like you know, structurally, if you will, is that he passed on some of that energy to those that were sitting there six months with him. And I'm talking about youth primarily, because these are young people, these are, these are the, the friends of, of, of David. And then they can basically pursue this agenda further on, because I don't think it's, it's also fair to, to expect that one man can change the thing, but what he did change is narrative. He showed, she showed us normalcy that we all want, that we all see. And the last thing, maybe just this Zagreb Belgrade role, I'm going to be very open about this. It's totally unconstructive, non constructive role. I mean, Zagreb's or Croatia's uh, uh, only, it seems to me, uh, foreign policy these days is Bosnia. Is there anything else that is wrong with, with in Croatia that possibly Croatia could work on except Bosnian matters? I don't, I don't see. Um, I don't see this being at all constructive. I see this as an uh, invasion if in, into sovereignty, if you will, of, of a country. I do understand relations very much so, but I also don't, don't see how um, they can benefit the, the actual citizens of Bosnia and Herzegovina, including Croats. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's really something really radically needs to change. I mean, at the same time, you have Croatia that is experiences all the bad stuff that the rest of the region experiences. Sometimes it feels that Croatia has you know, more bad news per capita than, than any other country in the region on a, on a given day. And yet, we're discussing Bosnian matters in Croatia. So I think it's really uh, time to, to that, for that to be changed and, and understand why it cannot, because there is also an uh, electoral system and there are all sorts of, sort of uh, uh, catch, catches there that, that uh, they cannot sort of put themselves away. But it's definitely, I don't see it as, as, as anything uh, constructive, let's put it that way. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much and thank you, thank you for your patience. Uh, now, I w I'm supposed to sum up and there is no way to sum it up, uh, but there is uh, something that I would just want to try for the next 50 seconds. So, you know, uh, among most famous tweets uh, whatsoever from the Western Balkans, there is this one by Nikola Dimitrov, foreign minister of, uh, of Macedonia, uh, saying whoever supports the start of accession talks with Macedonia is going to get a fresh package of Macedonian potatoes from himself. Uh, for you, I mean, we have heard a lot of fresh packages of tomatoes today on the panel, and there are energies, as we have been trying to say, in Bosnia uh, out there uh, that, that could be sent to those officials, partly in Brussels, in European capitals, in the U.S., that quite frequently claim that they are clueless about Bosnia. They don't know what to do. They are fed up. Uh, one, but really one sentence, which is eight seconds or ten seconds for each of you. What kind of a tweet, uh, I mean not a tweet, what kind of fresh potatoes could Bosnians uh, uh, send in a quest for re-engaging uh, with, together with the international community to change the surface and to move towards a, a normal Bosnia? Really, one short sentence, not, tell us not Cevapi, uh, because probably that, that, that's going to cause some stomach problems, uh, but something different. Adi, 
one sentence. What could we send? A message. What could we send? I mean, that is fr fresh tomatoes, tomatoes, virtual tomatoes, metaphoric tomatoes from Bosnia. In Gorazde, they produce uh, highly uh, highly technological uh, 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 products that are parts of the cars that are in each and every almost uh, in 80% of the cars that are worldwide produced. Uh, in order to produce them, you really have to work in a highly, highly organized way, in a very, very precise way. And you have to have people who are very, very well uh, 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 qualified to do that. I was there. 90% uh, of them are Bosnians and Herzegovinians, people from Bielna coming to Gorazde to work, people from West Mostar coming there to work, because it offers them opportunity to design and develop and produce things that they can also produce only in Germany and other okay, countries. Perfect. So I would send, okay. yeah, maybe parts of the Send cars. all European officials to Gorazde to work on the car. So, uh, Denis? Well, well, we always perform, performed best when we performed from the position and a point, point of view of discriminated and minorities. So I, 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 was, I would say that the best we can offer are our politics on behalf of those who are discriminated in the country. I think that that suits the best. Marika? There, uh, there is an expression in Bosnia which I heard a number of times um, from different people there and it's uh, one of the most important thing for people in Bosnia is uh, biti svoj na svome. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's, that's the message, let Bosnian people be svoj na svome and if you can help them as well. Okay. Alida? I would, put it's I would put it differently. We are the offered, everything, we have given lots. Mm -hmm. We keep on forgetting that Bosnia is not outside of this world. It's not isolated. We have given our best doctors, our best school teachers, our best everything. We are already part of this family. There is no other way to, 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 to put it but, but that we are already part of it. We have offered and given already everything we have. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for bearing with us uh, so long. Uh, my apology uh, to the organizers for uh, uh, just... Uh, uh, extending the, the, the debate for several minutes uh, in, a, in a Bosnian way. Uh, I wish you a nice evening. Uh, we continue tomorrow morning. Uh, uh, President Vucic and Alexander van der Bellen are going to address the audience and it might be that they, uh, they will also address the Bosnian issue in a certain way. Uh, thank you so much. Enjoy the evening uh, and forgive us, uh, please, again, for being too long and, and uh, you know, thank you.